Red Ducati sport bike is the staff of dreams. And the Panigale name immediately conjures up images of speed, performance and agility. The new V2 is testimony to that very appeal of Italian design and sportiness. It may be the entry level Ducati Panigale. But there's nothing entry level about its design, equipment, or performance. Now, sport bikes, you can classify them as the entry level sport bikes. Then there's the super sport class, which is up to 650, 660cc, right up to the litter class or super bike class. A couple of years ago, Ducati plonked a V4 in its Panigale V4, the litter class super bike. And now we have this. The Panigale V2, which replaces the 959 Panigale. Ducati calls this the middleweight sport bike, but it's got an engine with a 955cc displacement, which is almost close to litter class. But is it made only for a track? Or can you live with it on a daily basis? We'll ride it today on the road, on the street, and on the track as well to find out what exactly does the new Panigale V2 offer. It's certainly a thing of beauty. With gorgeous lines, the V2 is draped in a similarly styled fairing as its bigger sibling, the Panigale V4. The V2 also gets that single-sided swing arm with the rear wheel exposed on one side and the underbelly exhaust. Up close, you see a full-color TFT instrument console new handlebar controls and a beautifully designed top yoke. There's no doubt that the Panigale V2 is a special bike and it gets top shelf components with adjustable suspension and high quality brakes. Any angle you look at it from, it's a stunner. So how much power does the Panigale V2 make? The 955cc engine makes about 153 bhp of power, 104 Nm of torque. Peak power comes in at 10,700 rpm. But if you want to chase those revs, you'll get into trouble. And not just in speed terms, you'll get on the wrong side of the law. Let me give you a reference. Six gear at 4,000 rpm, you'll be sitting at 100 km per hour. And if you want to accelerate to the gears, 200 will come in no time. And if you have an enough long stretch of road, you'll go beyond 200, but it's highly dangerous and not advisable at all. But all that performance is reined in by a six-axis inertial measurement unit, IMU, which measures the bike's dynamics, how it rolls, how it pitches, how it yaws, and that powers the cornering ABS system, six levels of traction control, engine braking system, wheelie control system, and it also has a bi-directional quick shifter. So you don't really need to use the clutch to downshift or upshift packed with electronics to offer a safety net, but if you're not careful on the road, it could get you into trouble. The V2 may be the entry-level Panigale, but there's nothing entry-level about its performance. With over 150 brake horsepower, you will need more than beginner's skill to handle this baby. While it's still not as manic as the bigger V4, there's enough oomph, just a downshift and twist of the throttle away. There's still that mechanical exhaust and valve noise, 
But even with a smaller engine and less power, the V2 is quick without scaring the living daylights out of you. But eventually, the V2's true potential can be best enjoyed on a racetrack where you can get access to the ideal real estate to allow the V2 to stretch its legs. So how good is the Panigale V2? It's an absolutely exciting motorcycle, but only if you're going to frequent the racetrack very often. You can of course ride it on the street, but on an open road, if you explore its performance, you'll hit 200 km per hour in no time, and it'll be on the wrong side of the law. So, I would say this one is 70% track, 30% road use, but that committed riding position will tire you out in the daily traffic if you want to ride it for the commute or even in the city. But for performance junkies, it will certainly give you a very good platform to explore your track riding skills. So the question is, should you be looking at more power and more displacement? To have more performance, like the V4, you will need far more talent and superlative riding skills. For almost everyone else, the V2 will do everything, even the occasional weekend outing on the road. If not for anything else, just to let admirers enjoy the sight of a gorgeous Italian sport bike. Recognize the Turbo Blue Audi S5? Well, you have to, because we drove it exclusively. Siddharth has talked a lot about the Audi S5 Sportback. He's talked about the driving dynamics, its spectacular looks and its creature comforts. But here at Car & Bike, I am the tech guy, so I'm going to talk about the tech, the gadgetry inside the car. So let's get straight into it, literally. The interior of the Audi S5 Sportback is an audio-visual treat. And everything starts with this 12.3-inch display which Audi calls the virtual cockpit. And the cool thing about this is, apart from the sci-fi vibe of it, you can also change themes. So you can go into sports mode which will give you virtual speedometers. Right now we are in the dynamic mode so it will give you all kinds of information in a very dynamic way. And then there's also performance mode, which gives you something more digitally inspired. So it looks really, really cool and it's giving you a lot of information. So you can toggle through a, an assortment of settings. It can give you your fuel efficiency figures. It will give you what song you're playing, even mini album artwork. It will tell you what your phone is doing. Right now the phone is on CarPlay, so it's going to tell you that. And it will also give you a small visual identification into the navigation system. So you don't need to see sideways towards the main infotainment display. You can just follow the map straight from the virtual cockpit. Now that is really, really cool. On top of that, you get a heads up display on the screen, on the main window. And you can control the brightness of it. So it's always there. It's almost like augmented reality in front of you and it's again very very cool and the focus here clearly is on making the driving experience pleasurable. But what really stands out out here is the 10.1 inch MMI screen. So Audi calls its interface MMI and this is the new screen. It's got great resolution. All the user interface elements are very logical. The touch response is fabulous. It feels like a premium iPad Pro kind of a device. You get really large touch points. So all the user interface elements are really easy to use and easy to figure out. So the great bit is because of the haptic feedback, you can just keep driving and just tap and hit the touch point and you'll know because of the haptic feedback. You don't need to be looking on the left side and figuring out where is what. Well, 
Audi used to make things simpler previously because they had the dial out here and you could just seamlessly control this interface with that dial. Now that dial is gone, the screen is improved, it gets haptic feedback, but net net, I'm not too sure if it's an upgrade, but still pretty nice to have. And I said, it's an audio visual treat. Well, I've spoken about the visual element out here but the audio bit is just spectacular. You get a 19 speaker Bang & Olufsen sound system which packs a wallop. You get upwards of 700 watts of power. That's a lot. And this is probably the best b sound system I've ever tested. Regardless of the fact that this is inside a car. I've used some huge standalone b speakers but this one really stands out because it has that detail to sound it has that immersive effect you get 3d audio out here you get a surround sound effect which will piggyback sound from the left to right it is really really impressive and when you are driving this car then you are going to pump up the volume be it any kind of music be it r b be it techno be it rock whatever you like it will just kill it and actually I've really enjoyed listening to music in this car more so than even my AirPods Max. There are some wondrous elements in the S5 Sport Pack but with the good there is the bad. For a car that's expected to be more expensive than most of its rivals, it shoots itself on the foot by being stingy on the feature set. So shockingly, there is no wireless charging. You don't get keyless entry. The heated steering is also an add-on, as is blind spot monitoring. Only basic parking aid with reverse cameras and sensors are offered. So is connected car tech which gets added with a module. All of this is part of the more expensive convenience package. At the price they are selling the S5, I'd say it is highly inconvenient. It's quite clear the focus is on the driving experience on the Audi S5 Sportback. But still there are quite a bit of features which are truly spectacular and really augment the driving experience. Particularly that smashing Bang & Olufsen sound system. But when you're spending so much money, then you ought to expect more. And especially when you see a car like the BMW M340i, you are actually getting more for less. That's where the S5 Sportback actually misses out. The Maruti Suzuki Swift has been on sale in the country for more than a decade and a half and has crossed many important milestones during that period. At last count, it had already crossed the 23 lakh sales milestone in India. It's been three years since India's largest car maker launched a brand new generation of the hatch in the country, so it was about time that the car received a facelift. You're looking at India's highest selling car. In the month of February, no other car in the country could outsell the Maruti Suzuki Swift. Such is the popularity of this hatchback. Now the company has given it an update that has made it even more appealing. That includes a more powerful yet more fuel efficient engine. But we'll come to that in a bit. If you know the Swift moderately well, you know that the car gets this new dual tone color option. Apart from the solid fire red with midnight black roof you see here, you can also choose between pearl metallic midnight blue with pearl arctic white roof or pearl arctic white with midnight black roof. However, you get these only on the top ZXI plus variant. Other variants get 6 monotone color options. 
The big change on the front is a new grille that comes with this uh, big horizontal slat that is full of chrome. On the profile, the 15-inch alloys you see here are only available in the top two variants, the ZXi and the ZXi Plus. And finally, the new Swift also gets key synchronized auto foldable outside rear view mirrors. Everything else pretty much remains the same. That includes the projector headlamps with LED daytime running lamps, the bumpers, large halogen fog lamps, two-tone alloy wheels and the same LED tail lamps. The cabin also gets few yet significant changes. The revised twin pod instrument cluster now gets a 4.2 inch colored TFT screen gives you a lot of information and definitely looks much better than the monochrome unit seen earlier on the car. Apart from that, the 7 inch touchscreen gets an updated Smart Play Studio that is compatible with Apple CarPlay and Android Auto and also gets voice recognition. You can also control uh, this system through an app which is a remote app and you also have separate apps for navigation as well as radio. And finally, the new Swift also gets different upholstery on the seats which feel a tad bit more premium than the ones seen on the predecessor. The new Swift also gets cruise control and that along with the colored MID, reverse parking camera and follow me home headlamps can only be found on the ZXi Plus. The touchscreen system, steering mounted controls, leather wrapped steering wheel, engine start stop button and auto climate control are also available on the ZXi variant. Central locking, height adjustable driver's seat and adjustable front headrests go missing only from the base LXI. On the second row, adjustable headrests for two passengers and 60-40 split seats can again be found only on the top two variants. And still no armrest, AC vents or charging points on the second row. The car gets a boot capacity of 268 litres. It might be just a facelift but there's still lots new to talk about the heart of this car. The new generation K-Series 1.2 litre dual jet VVT petrol engine has been taken from the Baleno hatchback. The engine now makes 88 brake horsepower which is around 6 bhp more than before. A peak torque figure of 130 Nm is also quite healthy but arrives a bit late at 4200 rpm and that takes a little bit of fun away when you're behind the wheel of this car. But having said that, those extra horses mean the Swift has definitely become a more engaging drive than before. Like earlier, the Swift gets both 5-speed manual and 5-speed AMT variants. It is one of the many cars from the brand that continues to get the auto gear shift technology that promises clutch-free driving along with better fuel efficiency at a nominal cost, albeit with compromised driving pleasure. For the first time, the Swift gets the idle start-stop system seen on many other cars from Maruti Suzuki. It helps in achieving higher fuel efficiency and if Maruti is to be believed, the Swift now gives 23.2 km per litre on the manual and an even higher 23.7 km per litre on this AMT or AGS variant I am driving right now. Now that is a good 2 km per litre more than before. The Swift remains an agile car and driving it through traffic is very easy. It feels equally at home in the city or on empty roads. The revised steering helps in justifying the hot hatch tag that has always been associated with the car. The stiff ride and bigger brakes also help in keeping that reputation. This car is built for itself. On the safety front, the model now comes with electronic stability program with hill hold on the AMT versions. Dual airbags, ABS with EBD and ISOFIX anchors come as standard. The new Swift is approximately 20,000 rupees expensive than before. Prices for the manual variants start at 5,73,000 rupees and go up to 7,91,000 rupees for the dual tone models. The AGS is available on all but the base variants and is priced between 6,86,000 and 8,41,000 rupees. The car competes directly against the Hyundai Grand i10 Neos that is priced between 5,19,000 and 7,33,000 for the manual and 6,57,000 and 7,80,000 rupees for the AMT versions. The new Swift isn't exactly a value for money option and while the new features have made it a little more appealing, it has also become more expensive than before. But 
there are a lot of factors that will still make you choose this one over other cars in the segment including the trust you have in the maruti brand and those factors will ensure that this car most likely will hold on to its number one tag